Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Rima. I'm a fifth year medical student and I'll be giving a brief introduction on menstruation today. Um, this is a brief lecture. It's quite an interesting lecture actually. And this I think is, um, is, is not going to take that long, inshallah. Okay, so I like approaching things systematically. So I, so I really wanted to just give a, a good lecture outline and I wanted us to sort of check out the boxes for every uh, milestone that we progress throughout this lecture. So we're going to start with a brief introduction about the bladder structure before we begin. And then this is where the money's at, the mictarian reflex. And then we're going to give a brief about the systometrogram and sort of correlate it with the law of Laplace and then correlate everything all together. And um, you know, the funny thing about medicine is that we always learn the normal and then we progress to compare it with the abnormal. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the abnormalities in micturition. So um, this is quite an interesting word, micturition. I keep repeating this word. Micturition is a synonym to voiding or urination. This is just a fancy medical term, but it all, all means the same thing. So we're going to start with a brief about the bladder structure. The bladder is going to be our pouch. It looks like a pouch, okay? Um, and this pouch is made up of three muscle layers, and that's important to keep note of. Three muscle layers. Oh, you can't see the screen. Oh, okay, all right, I will do that. Okay. Okay, wonderful. I think it's, I think the screen is shared now. Is it? Yes, it is. Uh, okay, great. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so, uh, I was saying that the bladder structure, our, our bladder is sort of like our little coin pouch. It, it stores urine uh, until we're ready to void. And this, this coin pouch is made up of the most important thing, which is the detrusor muscle, which is made up of three, um, layers and these layers are smooth muscle layers okay i've taken the liberty to add a diagram but the important thing to remember here is that it's made up of a body and it's made up of a neck and and sort of um the body is the big part and this is where the urine collects and then we have this funnel shaped structure i hope you can see when i write on the screen i apologize there are many technical difficulties that come with zoom uh, meetings but i really want to make sure that everyone sees because the majority of this presentation is going to be heavily dependent on the mixturation reflex in the drawing part. So Laiba, can you help me out? Can you see when I draw or scribble on the screen? Um, uh, yes, we can. Uh, okay, great. Okay, amazing. So the neck part, this funnel shaped extension from the body, it passes all the way down to the urogenital triangle and connects all the way down to the urethra, okay? But this is the physiology part. This is where we actually start the lecture, okay? So why am I introducing this slide? I need you to know how much of urine can I hold in the bladder? And from knowing how much urine you hold in the bladder, you can understand the physiology of the systometrogram and the abnormalities that come with the, with the bladder. So the normal, the, the normal uh, bladder capacity is up to a thousand milliliters, but nobody can hold up to a thousand milliliters. We usually start to want to go to the bathroom at about 400 mLs, okay? At about 400 mLs, we start to get this urge to, to use the restroom. At 200 mLs, uh, this is where, I mean, the bladder is slightly stretched. It, it doesn't elicit a reflex, okay? All right, so we'll start here. This is it. This is the big. This is the big banger. Okay, like I'm going to draw as I go, and I've taken the liberty to sort of uh, divide the micturition reflex into two parts: a part where the bladder is full, and a part a part where the bladder is empty. And I'm going to start with the empty part. Okay, so <laughs> this is a little embarrassing, but you're going to see my drawing skills. And personally, I think I am Picasso. So this is what the bladder is going to look like. And then we have, this is what it's going to look like, okay? Now, I have a layer around the bladder and I mentioned this is important because this is the detrusor muscle and we said it's made up of three layers. And then we have two structures here. We have the internal urethral sphincter, 
And here on the outside, we have the external urethral sphincter, okay? So just to orient ourselves, this is when the bladder is empty and not full, okay? So detrusor muscle, internal urethral sphincter, and external urethral sphincter. Another important thing that I, I want to draw here is, this is as good as it gets, you guys. This is the cerebral cortex, and I don't know how to draw the pawns, so I'm going to draw it as a rectangle or, or a, a square. And then we have a section from the spinal cord. Now, why am I teaching neuro when we're studying the bladder? Because we have a brain bladder response that we need to know. How does your brain know you need to go to the bathroom? It knows from um, it knows from this brain bladder um, connection. Okay, so let's start with the brain bladder connection. I mentioned the normal structures. I oriented you with the pawns. This is going to be uh, from the. Oh, okay, uh, wonderful. This is going to be the thoraco lumbar vertebrae from the level of T eleven all the way to L2, okay? And then here we have the sacral portion. The sacral portion is going to be around S2, S3, and S4, okay? This is what we're looking at. These are the, the characters that we're working with. But the bladder is empty. <clears throat> the bladder... Yes. The bladder... <laughs> okay. The bladder is empty, okay? There's nothing stimulating the bladder because on the bladder wall, we have important stretch receptors. And if, if these stretch receptors are not stimulated, nothing is happening. So how does the brain know that nothing is happening? I'll tell you. We have these sensory receptors, okay? They're, they're a little deformed sensory receptors, but they're sensory receptors, <laughs> okay? These sensory receptors all travel all the way down to an area here and they synapse. What is this area here? This is going to be our first player. Okay, so we have sensory receptors. These sensory receptors, these are afferent fibers. Okay, so we have afferent sensory receptors. These go to the sacral region of the spinal cord and they uh, synapse with the lateral gray horn. <clears throat> they synapse with the lateral gray horn. Okay, once they, once they synapse with the lateral gray horn, they will go up, they will travel upwards they will travel upwards to the thoracolumbar area, and then they're going to synapse into a little area here before they progress. Where are they going to progress, you guys? They're going to go up, okay, here. We have a little a collection, and this is called the inferior mesenteric ganglion. From the inferior mesenteric ganglion, we're going to have two important players, okay? Two important players, one here and one there. Okay. All right. I hope this is clear so far. I'm going to draw a star here. This is the inferior mesenteric ganglion. So uh, at the inferior mesenteric ganglion, this is where I want us to focus a little. Okay. So we have two important receptors. We have one here. This is a receptor. It's, it's a pink receptor. It's a cute receptor. This is the beta-3 adrenergic receptor. And then we have another receptor here uh, at the uh, internal urethra sphincter. This is going to be you guessed it. I bet you didn't, but you did. This is the uh, alpha-1 adrenergic receptor, okay? So I'm going to sort of take a bigger screenshot into this right here. So we have two important receptors, and I've written it down here. I just really want to explain it as we go. So we have the beta-3, and then we have the alpha-1. What is the function of this beta-3? We have three important receptors that we need to keep, to keep note of, and these receptors are where the exam questions are going to be heavily reliant or dependent on. So the, for the beta-3 receptors, these are beta-3 adrenergic receptors. Okay, when we have an important uh, neurotransmitter called norepinephrine, norepinephrine binds to beta-3 adrenergic receptor, what happens? Okay, what happens here? Sorry, I'm just making sure that the audio is still clear. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so we have norepinephrine right here binding to the beta-3 adrenergic receptor on the surface of the detrusor muscle. This is when the bladder is empty. Once they bind, once they bind together, um, C 
sorry guys, I feel like the connection isn't, it's lagging. Is it lagging where you're at or no? Okay, great, everything's great. Okay, good, good, okay. So where was I? I was talking about the beta, beta 3 adrenergic receptor. So once we bind, the, the norepinephrine binds to beta 3, okay, normally what happens, it's going to stimulate potassium to leave the cell, okay? So potassium is going to leave or exit the cell. Without potassium, I cannot initiate an action potential. And therefore, the main goal of all of this is that the muscle is going to relax. And I need the muscle to relax because the bladder is empty. I don't need the muscle to contract. Okay, and this is where, this is on the surface of the detrusor muscle. On the same time, we have alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. What are these going to do? These also work with norepinephrine. But in this case, we're not going to have potassium leave. These are going to inhibit the function of the internal urethral, uh, stimulate the function of an, uh, the internal urethral sphincter by inhibiting it. What does that mean? That sounds a little intense. Basically, I am going to contract the internal urethral sphincter to prevent leakage of the urine. I'm preventing the urine from leaking because I don't need, I, I relax the internal urethral sphincter when I want the urine to, to leave. If I don't want the urine to leave, I contract the sphincters, okay? So this is what we are working with here. Are we done? Unfortunately, no, we're not. So this is the first set of, of neurons that are going to go. Okay, now how can I make it reach the brain cortex all the way to the brain? How does the, my brain know that I'm, I need the impulses to, uh, uh, how does my brain know that my bladder is empty? So we finished at the first level, which is from the sacral. We went to the inferior mesenteric ganglion. We uh, synapsed, and then the synapse gave me two uh, important set of neurons. One acts on beta three and one acts on alpha one. The one that acts on alpha one constricts the internal urethral sphincter and prevents urine from leakage. And the second one, uh, on the one on the beta-3, prevents the or relaxes the detrusor muscle. Okay, perfect. But um, we are going to continue. How are they going to go to the cortex? Some of these neurons travel all the way upwards. Okay, they continue traveling upwards. Where do they go? They will travel to the pons. Okay, now what happens at the pons area? Okay, so this is what the pawns look like. I, I, I drew the pawns for you. Now the pawns is sort of our on and off switch button, okay? And for our on and off switch button to work, we need two important things. We have on and we have off. Okay, let's make two important buttons. One is going to turn on and one is going to turn off. What are these called? Like, first of all, we have the red one. The red one is called the Pontine Storage Center, PSC, the Pontine Storage Center. And from the name, it stimulates the bladder to what? To store the urine. And the, the second one, the black one is called the Pontine, <clears throat> it's called the Pontine Nectarition Center, the PMC. So this stimulates voiding from the name, okay? All right, so. I am, I'm at a baseline of an empty bladder. I don't need the bladder to empty. So which one am I going to activate? The red one, the pontine storage center. I'm going to stimulate the pontine storage center or the red one. Okay, great, perfect. So after that, the more or other impulses are going to travel all the way up to the cerebral cortex. Okay, we get to the cerebral cortex part. And do we stop here? No, now the brain is informed. The brain is informed that, oh, okay, so the bladder's empty. How is the brain gonna tell the bladder not to work? This is where we're at. Okay, from the pontine, or the, from, the, uh, from the cerebral cortex, I'm going to send higher impulses or higher cortical impulses. These are going to come down and descend. These are going to stimulate the storage center. So it's sort of like a reflex. It's going to stimulate the storage center. And from the storage center, it is going to activate the, uh, uh, sorry, it's going to activate the storage center and inhibit the mechanician center. So to switch on, switch off. Now from the pawns, we're going to go down. Where do you think we're going to synapse? We're going to, where do you think we're going to sy synapse? We're going to synapse at the inferior mesenteric ganglion. We're gonna go down, we're gonna sign up, same pathway, okay? And then the same pathway is going to activate what I just taught you. So a, a, the inferior mesenteric ganglion is going to continue the same path, beta, beta three and alpha one. Are we done? Unfortunately not, because we have one more 
player that we need to discuss. So we're gonna go down and we're gonna discuss one more player. I'm gonna make this player in orange. And orange in our session is always parasympathetic. Okay, so orange is always parasympathetic. So for the parasympathetic portion, this is important. I will explain the physiology of it, okay? For the parasympathetic portion, we're working with M3 receptors. This looks like a, an ambiguous eight. This is an M3 receptor or muscarinic receptors, okay? With muscarinic receptors, they work not with norepinephrine, but with acetylcholine or acetylcholine. Once acetylcholine binds to M3, they will stimulate it. And what happens? We will increase calcium. And with the increase of calcium, we're going to increase contraction, which is going to contract the external urethral sphincter. And this is going to pre prevent urinary leakage or prevent urination. The important thing that I want to mention here is this parasympathetic pathway acts on the external urethral sphincter, but it uses a somatic pathway. And this is the only one that's somatic. So this uses a somatic pathway. And this somatic pathway is going to go to the external urethral, urethral sphincter via a pudendal nerve. Then don't no. <laughs> let's just let's just not. <laughs> so P U D. Okay. Like I hope it's clear. Is it clear? Are we on the same page? This is usually where the first checkpoints at. This is are we good so far? <laughs> yes, gonna, we are. Thank you. <laughs> great. We're going to just recap very very quickly. So. Recap goes as follows. We have sensory afferent fibers coming from the detrusor muscle. Sensory afferent fibers are gonna go all the way to the sacral region, S2, S3, S4. From the sacral region, we're going to travel upwards to the thoracolumbar legion, region. From the thoracolumbar region, we're going to synapse uh, to the motor portion, which is the postganglionic motor neurons at an important uh, structure. This is called the inferior mesenteric ganglion. From the inferior mesenteric ganglion, I'm going to give two branches, one, uh, two, uh, two branches to innervate the detrusor muscle, one hypogastric and one that is going to innervate the internal, internal urethral sphincter. The one that's innervating the detrusor directly is the beta-3 adrenergic receptor, and the one innervating the internal urethral sphincter is the alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. Are we done? No, we're going to have the same pathway moving upwards. From this area, we're going to simulate the uh, the pons. It's because fibers are going to ascend. This is in yellow, the fibers ascending upwards. As the fibers ascend upwards, we're gonna go to the pons area, our on and off box. Our on box is going to be the, the nucleus, which is, or the area, which is called the um, pontine, storage center. And the other one is called the pontine micturition center. From the cerebral cortex, we're going to activate the pontine storage center and inhibit the pontine uh, micturition center. Then we're going to go down and descend through from the, the T, uh, from the thoracolumbar area, we're going to synapse again, same pathway. And then we're going to go descend downwards to the sacral region. And then we are going to activate one more player, which is an orange, which are, is our parasympathetic pathway. And in our parasympathetic pathway, we are going to activate the M3 muscarinic receptors. Uh, in this case, we have acetylcholine as a player. So ACTH instead of NE, which is norepinephrine here in red. And uh, in this case, are we going to activate or inhibit? We are going to activate. So we are going to uh, stimulate acetylcholine because I want this muscle to contract, not relax. Okay. So contract, contract, and then the detrusor is going to relax. So what happens when the bladder is empty? This is a spinal cord response. This is directly from your lecture. So I just wanted to apply what I just said through drawing knowledge <laughs> all the way to um, the what's actually written in your lecture. So here, we have, and this is a reflex that is purely elicited, elicited by the spinal cord. And I mentioned this above. We have several cent centers located in the cerebral cortex. These are inhibitory centers. And I mentioned that this is how the, like, this is how the, the response travels from the cerebral cortex all the way down. Uh, even if micturition reflex occurs, higher centers will still keep it inhibited, causes, causing tonic contraction. And this is how the brain knows. This is how 
we know when to use the bathroom and when not to use the bathroom and what is when is when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. Okay, these are the key receptors. This is what's this is where the MCQs come. This is important. Okay, so we have beta adrenergic receptors, we have alpha one adrenergic receptors, and M three muscarinic receptors. What is the main function of beta three? This is to induce relaxation of the detrusor, detrusor muscle by binding epinephrine and it causes potassium to leave the cell. What is the end result of this? Relaxation. Okay, and then the second important thing is the alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. The normal function is to bind norepinephrine. Both of these bind norepinephrine and this is going to contract the internal urethrosphincter and prevent urinary leakage. And the last one is going to be the M3 muscarinic receptors and the normal function of this is to bind acetylcholine, and this is going to increase the contraction rate of the external urethral sphincter and prevent the voiding. So this is the most important part of the first checkpoint. So are we all good? We said we're good. We're going to keep going. What happens when the bladder is full? When the bladder is full, it's very similar. It's just we're sort of doing the opposite. So we're, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to draw the bladder, our cool bladder, and then we have two important sphincters. We have the internal urethral sphincter and then the external one. And then we have the detrusor muscle. <clears throat> In this pathway, this is when the bladder is full. Okay, so this is the bladder being full. Um, let's draw urine. Okay, at 200 ml, you start to feel, you start to feel your bladder being full. But at 400, you start to have the urge to void. The bladder has stretched enough. So let's say we have 400 ml. We want to use the, the, the restroom. So we have the same set of sensory fibers, our claw sensory fibers, and then we have the our cool cerebral cortex, so CC. We have our weird um, rectangle or our pawns with our switch on and switch off button. And then we have two sections from the spinal cord. Um, Okay, here we go. Spinal cord looks like a sponge, but it's 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 got character in my opinion. So this is the thoracolumbar area and this is the sacral area, as I mentioned. So we're gonna go step by step. All right, so number one. Here, there's a little difference that we want to note of. Okay, so the sensory fibers are gonna go to an area. I wrote this up so we can note the difference. So here, I said they're gonna to go to the lateral gray horn. In the, when the bladder is full, we're going to go to the posterior gray horn. Okay, we're gonna to go to the posterior gray horn. We're going to synapse, so this is our area of synapse, and then we're gonna go directly up to the pons, bypassing the thoracolumbar area. So we're bypassing the thoracolumbar area. Now, the bladder is full, so we said we have two little switch on and switch off buttons, if you guys remember. So switch on is going to be, this is the on, or not necessarily, this is going to be our uh, pontine uh, storage center, and this is the pontine micturition center. Depending on which one I wanna turn off is the off and off, uh, on button, okay? So I go up all the way to the pons, and from the pons, I go to the cerebral cortex, and I tell the cerebral cortex, hey, my bladder is full. How about we initiate micturition? And this is what happens here. So I go, and the cerebral cortex is going to send neurons. These neurons are going to activate two parts. They're going to activate the uh, storage center and the micturition center. The storage center is going to be inhibited this time, and the micturition center is going to be activated so from here, where can I go? This is step one. We can say that this is step one, okay? And this is step two. This is uh, step two. And we stopped at the pons area. We bypassed the thoracolumbar. We went to the pons. From the pons, where can we go? We can go down. We want to send axons. These axons are going to move from the pons. This is the pons. They're going to go to the thoracolumbar area. And the same thing is going to repeat itself. So we're going to synapse here in a, and then we're going to go outside and sign synapse and motor post uh, uh post ganglionic motor neurons this is called the this is sort of the the inferior mesenteric ganglion and then we're going to give 
two important structures, same, same, same as the as the part before. We're going to give two important structures, and these structures are going to act with our pink receptors, our beta two adrenergic receptors, and the second one, which is the alpha one adrenergic receptor. But this time, the effect is going to be a bit different. So, let's discuss our receptors, which is where the MCQs can happen. So we have two receptors. <clears throat> we have the beta two adrenergic receptors, and in the first, when the bladder is, is full, it contracts the trusor muscle. Here, I'm sending inhibitory signals. These inhibitory signals are going to be, so I'm gonna just denote it here. These are going to be inhibitory signals. So I'm inhibiting beta two. If I'm decreasing or inhibiting beta two, so it's either decreasing the neuronal imp impulse to beta two or inhibiting beta two, what is going to happen? I am going to not relax the detrusor. I'm going to give an opposite effect. So this is going to decrease the relaxation process. And this is where a lot of students make mistake, mistakes because this is just a play on words. I'm decreasing the relaxation process, but ultimately I'm increasing contraction. So this is where the exam question can come up and this is where they can trick you. So you're decreasing the pathway, but you're increasing the contraction here in the opposite and you're decreasing the relaxation. Uh, because normally when we do physiology, contraction is always increased, right? But here it's decreased because the, the original pathway is increased. I hope that makes sense. And then we have the alpha-1 receptor. If it doesn't make sense, I'll go over it in the summary. Okay, so in the alpha-1 receptor, which is our other pink receptors on the uh, receptor on the internal urethral sphincter, we are going to both of these without saying you're supposed to be um, you're supposed to be scientists by now, norepinephrine scientists. Uh, uh, these two react to norepinephrine, these two receptors. <clears throat> With the alpha-1 portion, it will react to norepinephrine, but the same thing is going to apply. It's going to either be inhibited or decreased. Okay, what does this mean? If I activate this process, the alpha-1 adrenergic, what happens here? The internal urethral sphincter is going to be contracted. However, if I relax it, if I inhibit the, 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 the baseline of this sphincter, what's going to happen? I'm going to decrease the contraction and I'm going to increase relaxation this is it this is the gist of the whole lecture if you know this you are going to be good inshallah but then yeah um and then we have one more set of fibers I told you always in, if it's in, in, in orange it's parasympathetic we have one more parasympathetic so we have one more uh, sort of station where we relay our, our signals. And the, this station is going to be to the parasympathetic part. So I'm just gonna draw it here. We're going to the parasympathetic part. When we go to, when we, once we get to the parasympathetic part, we have our third important receptor, which is the M3 muscarinic receptor. And this one does not react to um, uh, norepinephrine. This one reacts to, to acetylcholine. If you remember, this is also an important MCQ area. So this reacts to acetylcholine instead of norepinephrine. So in the normal state or in our previous state, if the bladder is empty, what happens here? This receptor, normally, this is the uh, M3 receptor. This uh, receptor normally, uh, it, it induces contraction of the external urethral sphincter. And I told you through the parasympathetic pathway, and this is the only somatic pathway that we have, and it works through the pudendal nerve. So if I, if I send inhibitory signals, what's going to happen here? So instead of it contracting, I'm going to stimulate the M3 receptor because here the baseline of the M3 receptor is a bit different than the alpha one and the beta two because M3, if, I, if, if, if acetylcholine binds to M3, what happens? I'm going to increase calcium and I'm going to increase contraction. So I want to inhibit this process. By sending inhibitory signals, I'm inhibiting the, uh, the connection, the, cotin the nicotinic muscles or the, or the nicotinic connection that happens here. And therefore I'm inducing relaxation. This is when voiding happens, which includes, which or uh, yani leads to voiding. This is what I mean by, the, the, by inhibiting the baseline of M3. So this is what happens uh, in this process, M3 
nicotinic receptors or, or type one nicotinic receptors, you just need to know the keywords here. Beta two, alpha one, M three. Okay, let's let's recap very quickly. I hope this is clear. Is this clear? Are you guys with me so far? Yes, everything's clear, thank you. Okay, wonderful. So we are going to just summarize where we are. This is our second checkpoint. We're just gonna summarize very quickly. So second pathway, second pathway, sensory afferent fibers. We've, we've reached a maximum capacity of 400. This isn't a maximum capacity, but we wanna go to the restroom. So we've reached the capacity of 400 milliliters. We have sensory fibers. Sensory fibers go where? They go upwards, they move up. So this is where we are. We move upwards, we're bypassing. We're here and then we're bypassing all the way upwards to where? To the pons area. And from the pons, we're going to the cerebral cortex. From the cerebral cortex, we're going to send inhibitory neurons or, or just let's say we're going to send signals. These signals are gonna to go to the pons. From the pons, we have two important switches. We have the pontine, uh, the, the pontine storage, uh, uh, the pontine storage center, and then we have the pontine mixtration center. We're going to activate the pontine mixtration center here. And then from the pontine mixtration center, we're going to send higher function uh, inhibitory um, signals to two layers of the spinal cord, the thoracolumbar and the sacral this time. Thoracolumbar, we're going to synapse and send it all the way to the inferior mesenteric ganglion. From there, we're going to activate the beta-2 and the alpha-1. Beta-2, this time, we're going to decrease the activity of beta-2, which is going to induce a contraction of the muscle. Number two, we're going to decrease the activity of alpha-alpha-1. If I decrease the activity of alpha-1, what happens? I'm inducing relaxation. Same thing applies to M3. If I allow an acetylcholine and M3 to bind to each other, what happens? I'm ultimately increasing calcium, and this is going to increase contraction, which results in, um, uh, which is, if I allow this to happen, I'm increasing calcium and I'm increasing contraction. Am I in? Am I lagging, you guys? Okay, I hope not. Okay. All right. Um, okay, sorry. I think. Okay. Good. Okay, excellent. So we're done with the important part. Of the of this lecture, this is it. This is this is. I told you, if you understand this, this is good. This is excellent. I am. I want to stimulate relaxation here. This is what I explained at the, at the above portion. Is when I elicit contraction, I am preventing voiding. If I am inhibiting this, I'm going to stimulate relaxation and therefore stimulate voiding. Okay, great. Now this. Personally, I think this could come up as an MCQ, okay? So this could be an MCQ. How could they bring this as an MCQ? They could tell you, um, they could bring the structure since it's from the lecture directly, and they can tell you uh, at which step in the following can X, Y, Z happen. So I think it's really important to understand the structure. I explained it to you in, in a simplified board version above, and this is sort of going to be where the questions are going to be, I hope, inshallah. So we have two portions of the mixtration reflex, involuntary, involuntary. I told you the involuntary portion is related to these stretch receptors. So this is step one. These step receptor, receptors uh, correlate to this portion, my little claw looking stretch receptors. Okay, so we have the first portion, stretch receptors. Where are they going? They're going to go upwards in the involuntary. Signals go to the bladder, all the way to the spinal cord at the sacral portion. So this is where we are, I'm just going to orient you on my drawing. We are here, here, okay? So we go to the sacral portion, so S2, S3, or S4, and then uh, through parasympathetic fibers in the pelvic nerve, and then we have efferent signals that excite the detrusor muscle. When this is, just to orient you, this is when we want to void, okay? And then we told, I told you that we have fibers that will come down and these fibers, this is the para, 
sympathetic ganglion of the bladder, we have fibers that are gonna come. These fibers are going to allow the urine to void. How? By two things. I'm going to cause the detrusor muscles. I'm affecting two things. You can see here on the line, let me actually make it a little clearer. This is the ganglion. The ganglion is going to give, to give two parts. One part is going to affect the detrusor muscle fibers and one part is going to affect the internal atrial sphincter. Where does this correlate with my drawing? Right here just so you understand where we, where we are, okay? So I'm going to cause the beta 2 adrenergic receptors to relax, I'm inhibiting them. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna relax the detrusor, detrusor muscle, okay? And then the internal urethral sphincter, I'm going to relax the internal urethral sphincter. <clears throat> I'm going to cause the detrusor muscle to contract, not relax, sorry. And then the internal urethral sphincter is going to relax, okay? Now, uh, this is for the first portion. This portion is okay. Now do the second portion, the voluntary portion. The voluntary portion is the urine, خلاص, I've, I've relaxed the internal urethral sphincter. This is what they mean by voluntary. Once the urine collects here, and then I have the urethral opening, once the urine starts to collect here, this is where you start to feel the urge. You either make it or don't to the, to the restroom. So this is the voluntary portion. You either hold it in or you can't anymore because your bladder is extremely full. So the stretch portion, if, if I have a problem with the stretch reflex or this, this problem, this is what results in something called an, an atonic bladder. And I'm gonna discuss that a little further towards the end. However, the voluntary control portion, if there's a problem with the sphincter, the, the voluntary control portion, portion is related usually to the external sphincter. If I have a problem with the external sphincter, this could be results in something called uh, incontinence. And I'm gonna also touch on that towards the end. But I'm just trying to tie everything together. So for step five, where we, where are we? We're at step five, we're at the pawns, okay? For the voluntary control. The pawns are going to receive the stretch signals. It is uh, now time to urinate. So the pawns is going to return the signal all the way down. And then here, it's, we're gonna return the signal down. And then we are going to cause the detrusor muscles uh, to uh, contract and the internal urethral sphincter to relax. The urine starts to collect all the way down. And then we have um, uh, we have one more step here towards the end. So where are we? We're at seven, right? We're done with six, we're at seven. So um, we said it keeps the internal urethral sphincter contracted, okay? Until you're ready to go, until you're ready to go. Once it's, it's time or you're ready to go, the pawns uh, are, is going to stop the signal, the signal of, of wanting to, to withhold the urine and the urethral sphincter is going to relax. And then the urine is going to be voided. So this is, this is it in, in sort of a very simplified version. This is where you should focus. You should, how, how should you tackle this lecture? You should tackle these steps so one, two, three, four, five, you should know what each, which each, what each step stands for and know what could be the pathology that could arise. And I'm going to touch bases on that towards the end. But that's very in a simplified version. Which part of it, which steps are involved in the voluntary portion? Which steps are involved in the involuntary portion? So in the involuntary portion, one, two, here, one, two, three, right there, and then four. These all are related to just letting the brain know that the bladder is full. We're still, we're still full. We have not voided yet. Once we're ready to void, all the signals that are coming from the pond are inhibited. These are the signals that sort of keep the bladder um, or keep the sphincters at a, at a tight leash. Once we're ready, the external urethral sphincter gets to uh, relax completely and we can void. Okay, are we good so far? This is our second checkpoint. This is this is the gist of the lecture. If you understand this portion, inshallah, you'll be able to answer all the questions from the lecture. I'm going to stop my sharing just for a moment. I wanna read the chats. Okay, awesome. Okay, great. Okay. All right, take a moment to breathe. We're gonna start with the cystometrogram. This is very simple. This is sort of, it's, it's very, um, 
once you, once you understand the physiology portion, it's very easy to sort of correlate it with how can we test the bladder? <clears throat> so we're going to start with this portion, the cystometrogram. The cystometrogram, cysto, usually refers to bladder. So cystometrogram is a device that measures the pressure, the pressure and the urine volume, okay? I'm going to explain it as we go, like, okay. So how am I going to draw it? It's it, when once we want to measure the bladder, we have a catheter here. We have a double lumen catheter. Double lumen manata, it has two, two parts. One part is going to be connected to a sort of a device that tells you what the pressure is. This is a pressure trans transducer. And one part is going to be connected to water. This is going to pump. Um, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do is fill the bladder and check the stretch of the bladder as I go. And this is going to be documented on a graph that looks sort of like this, this one, okay? This is the, this is the bladder that it's going to be documented. Now, on exams, the most important uh, diagram that's going to show up is either this one or that one. These are the important ones, okay? Uh, okay, like. The cystometrogram simply, I'll just add a page, an empty page, so I can explain it to you. And, and if you understand it, inshallah, it's going to be very simple. So we have, we, when we want to plot, we have two portions here. We have the x-axis and we have the y-axis. On the x-axis, I have the volume. Okay. And then on the y-axis, I have the pressure on the bladder wall. And this is measured in centimeters of water. Okay, I really want to make this bigger. Like, okay. All right, like, what is the concept behind it? The concept behind it is when we're at point zero, okay, when we're when the volume is at the zero, the pressure is at zero as well. When we start to, to build the, the or to increase the volume in the bladder, the pressure is going to increase. So if you see here, that we are starting to increase the pressure. So let's say, now this is point volume, this is point, methanin, 50. This is 50 ml. At 50 ml, or when the volume is 50, how much is the pressure? So the pressure is about five centimeters of water, five centimeters of water, okay? The pressure is at five centimeters of water. If I increase the pressure up to 100, let's say, you know, 100, I'm still bordering beyond the five centimeters to 10 centimeters of water. I'm not, in, I'm not increasing dramatically. But what happens when I'm at, let's say, 400 milliliters of water, of, of, uh, water or urine? The pressure is going to increase. And this is what it shows. This is here. I want a really good diagram. This one. Let's see this one. This is the basal cysto metrogram. What does that mean? Here, at point zero, when the volume in milliliters is at zero, the uh, water or the, uh, the pressure, this is pressure, the pressure is at uh, 10, uh, is at zero. When I'm at 100, the pressure is about, let's say, five. Or 50, when I'm at 50, the pressure is kind of around five. How does, how does that mathematically um, how does that mathematically make sense? When I'm at 50 and 100, the pressure is sort of borderlining at five. When I'm at 200, the pressure isn't that different. But what about when I'm at 300, the pressure increases to 10? What about 400? The pressure almost doubles. How's that explained? In what, how does that make sense? So we have, this is explained by this little guy, the law of Laplace. And, and he is a physicist, I think. Don't quote me on that. But he was explaining that you know, the concept of tension in the walls of hollow spheres, they depend on the pressure and the content, the pressure of the contents and the radius. What does that mean? So Laplace was trying to explain the theory behind hollow structures. We have many hollow structures in our body. We have the heart, we have blood vessels, we have a lot of hollow things. So the tension, the tension inside this is dependent on two things. It is dependent on the pressure, sorry, pressure, and it is dependent on the radius. How can I apply that and make it make sense? Okay, make it make sense. So uh, we have a balloon. This is a balloon. 
The balloon is made up of rubber and I'm trying to blow air into this balloon. So the tension from the wall of the rubber exerts energy or exerts force. This is the tension. Just as much as the air inside exerts pressure outside. So I have two forces that are counteracting each other. Whichever one of them is greater wins. So if the pressure is greater inside, I blow more and more and more air, the balloon gets bigger. That means the pressure is greater. What, at some point, the tension is going to be greater. So the balloon's going to pop. That's basically what we're trying to understand. How can I apply this towards this? Okay, so the bladder, we have a basal state in the bladder. This is what we keep referring or, or coming back to, a basal state in the bladder. When the volume reaches a certain point, okay, the bladder is going to stretch. And this stretch results in something called micturition contractions or micturition waves, okay? These micturition waves, basically in a simplified version, the bladder contracts and, and the pressure increases and then it returns back to the baseline. The baseline state as in the baseline state, state where we were at, which is about 20. So I reach a point in which I've inflated the bladder. Okay, let's see. I've inflated the bladder at, a, at, an, at an enough volume. This is my bladder. I've inflated it at an enough volume of 400. This is when the voiding urge starts to begin. And, and at that point, when I really need to use the restroom, the detrusor muscles that are present start to contract, okay? They contract. And once they contract, they contract in a wave-like manner or a wave-like portion. These wave-like like, um, patterns are called micturition contractions. So they increase and then come back to the baseline. And what is their baseline? Their baseline is at a 20 here, right there whatever baseline they're at, okay? That means the pressure is going to increase, but the volume is going to be the same. Same as if I have a balloon and I filled it with air, I already closed the balloon. I keep pressing on the balloon in the center. The pressure increases, the, the pressure inside of it, it could pop. But if I remove my hands, the balloon is gonna take its normal shape again. The volume of air inside is the same, but it's just dependent on pressure. So this is the whole concept of this. So if I could leave you with a, a take home uh, message from the this this uh, systole metrogram is we are measuring the urine volume. With the urine volume, we're measuring measuring the pressure at each and every urine urine, urine, vo urine volume of the bladder. Okay, at the at the first portion up until two hundred, we have stability. Nothing is happening. Why? Because I have a basal tone in the bladder. I have a basal tone that allows it to stretch up to a certain point. Beyond that point, we have increase in pressure. We have tremendous pressure. This pressure is putting pressure on the tone itself. And therefore, the bladder starts contracting. And the contraction is in a, uh, in a wave-like manner. These are called micturition waves or contractions. Okay, And this makes the bladder contract and the pressure increase and then it returns back to its baseline. Same as the balloon. If I have a balloon, I uh, put air into the balloon The up to a certain point. I put, let's say, 200, um, uh, 200 uh, uh, MMHGs of, uh, of air into the balloon. Once I put it into the balloon, I can press the balloon uh, on the side. And once I press the balloons on the side, the balloon could pop. Why? Because there's increased pressure. However, the volume is still intact. It's the same volume. I just increased the pressure. It's the same concept. And once I remove my hands from the balloon, the balloon's going to return back to its normal state. So this is the same concept here with the cysto urethrogram. I hope at this, this is our third checkpoint, right? Yeah. So our third checkpoint, we're fine. I hope we're fine. We're okay. We just discussed so far, just so I can recap, we discussed the physiology, here we started. We started with the anatomy, we talked about the detrusor muscle, we said that the detrusor muscle is made up of three portions. Then I moved forward to the uh, micturition reflex and I mentioned that we have uh, a certain pathophysiology that comes to it and I, disc I discussed with you what happens when the bladder is empty and what happens when the bladder is full. And then that ended our first uh, check, uh, our first and second, second checkpoints. And then we talked about the systometrogram and the Laplace law. And um, 
personally speaking, I don't think they are going to, uh, from my knowledge, they're not going to ask you in exam questions to calculate the Laplace law. It's good to know the formula. However, it's important just to understand the application process and that um, what counteracts this portion of, of the voiding of when the intervesical volume inside the bladder increases, why does it stay uh, consistent up to 400 and then the pressure spikes? This is explained by the law of Laplace. This is our third checkpoint. And then we have the uh, abnormalities that can face the bladder. So we're just gonna take a second to breathe. I'm going to check if there are any questions in the chat. Okay, wonderful. No questions. Okay, good. Okay, great. Okay, for the last portion, I don't want this lecture to be very long, but for the last portion, we're just going to talk about the uh, problems that could arise in the bladder. So I've, I've taken the liberty to sort of make it a little more approachable. So we have three important clinical relevances. When I was in first year, my the fav, my you know, the part that I loved the most about lectures or physiology lectures, be it or anatomy lectures or embryology lectures, are the clinical relevances because I, I thought that that is more applicable to 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 real life. And uh, I want to leave you with this uh, sort of anecdote. So these things, the incontinence, you're going to see it in, in, in real life. You're going to see it once you get to your clinical years, once you get to the fourth year, especially in your ob rotation, in your um, urology rotation, when you do, uh, when you do, um, uh, when you do surgery and, and it's going to be very interesting. So maybe the physiology portion is not going to be as important and you're not going to stress out about beta two and beta three and alpha one. And, but the, the anatomy part and the, um, the clinical relevance part is something you want to stick in. You want this to stick with you. So I d divided it into three important por portions of the of the abnormalities that could arise in the bladder. So one, the first one is an atonic bladder. What is an atonic bladder? So an atonic bladder simply is a bladder that is not functional, okay? So what does it, what, what do I mean by a bladder that is not functional? So individuals here are unaware that the bladder is filling. So I told you, remember this diagram that I kept telling you to, to really master? Because in the exam question, they could bring you this, this diagram and this can, they can tell you at which portion in the pathway will um, a, 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 male, a male presents to you with um, increased uh, dribbling, uh, they, are, they have nocturia at night, um, and they are trying to describe a scenario of an atonic bladder. And they want to tell you, and the key feature here is that voluntary micturition is still possible. They can go to the bathroom on their own. They just don't know that their bladder is filling. So they can build, their bladder can fill beyond the capacity. And once their bladder fills beyond the capacity, they'll start leaking urine, essentially. But they describe to you a scenario of an, an atonic bladder. And they tell you at which part of the pathway will, or which part of the fat pathway is defective. So you know that, we have sensory receptors, the sensory receptors within the wall of the detrusor muscle. And these sensory receptors tell you when the muscle is stretched. So if there's a defect in step one, which is the involuntary part of the, of the process, this can tell you, or this is the indicative factor versus the voluntary portion, which is related to the external urethral sphincter. He can still go to the bathroom. Voluntary part is normal. So this part is normal. The problem is in, within this area. So what is atonic bladder? So atonic bladder is a problem with the sensory uh, innervation that tells you, or the stretch receptors that are located on the wall of the bladder, and individuals are unaware of bladder filling or distension. Um, so there is no cure for atonic bladder, which is sad, and the bladder is going to fill, like I explained, beyond the capacity, and it's going to overflow, and the person cannot micturate at normal intervals. Let's say if you drink, this is a, just a sort of a layman example. It's not uh, scientific, but I'm trying to explain to you a concept. For every five glasses of water that you drink throughout the day, you go and you, you go to the bathroom twice, right? And you know that because your brain tells you that you need to go. Your, your bladder is full and, and you feel like you need to avoid. If you drink 
five glasses of water and you need to go for every five glasses, you need to go twice to the restroom and you have missed out on going to the restroom. Imagine how full your bladder is going to be. So this is essentially what the idea of atonic bladder is. And this has no cure. The second uh, sort of umbrella term that I wanted to um, uh, start with is incontinence. So incontinence is, is quite the interesting topic because incontinence could be due to multiple underlying reasons and causes. It could be uh, congenital, it could be due to trauma, it could be secondary to a tumor that's compressing. It, so there are many, many causes of, of incontinence. The first kind of incontinence, and this is how I saw it in your lectures, they were a little the, the division was a little different. So I wanted to sort of just organize your thoughts. So for the urge incontinence, this is the first kind of incontinence that we have. Incontinence means continence is to contain. So incontinence is the inability to contain urine. So patients cannot contain the, the urine that they have versus the atonic bladder in which patients can contain the urine, but they are unaware that their bladder is filling. Uh, in both cases, which is a little tricky, in both cases, patients are going to present with leaking of urine. But the pathophysiology of, of, of these two is a little different. So with incontinence, we have the first one, which is urge incontinence. This is basically due to an overactive bladder. And this is where you need to focus on the um, literal definition that was provided in your slides. So the doctor tells you that it's due to urgency. Urgency means the patient needs to go to the restroom. They feel like, I need to go right now. Uh, and this is usually accompanied by frequency. So frequency, they go to the bathroom a lot. Nocturia, what nocturia just is a fancy word for needing to void at night or voiding at night a lot with or without urgency or incontinence in the absence of urinary tract infection. Is this important? The key word here is that there's no urinary tract infection because urinary tract infection can mimic urge incontinence. They can, uh, they're irritative symptoms to the, to the urinary system. And they don't have any obvious pathologies that are present. So this is the for the definition portion. I just wanted to sort of break it down in your lecture. This is what an overactive bladder looks like. This is the urge incontinence. This is, uh, we also call it an overactive bladder. Why? Because there is an overactive detrusor muscle. Detrusor muscle is our key player. I told you if detrusor muscle, internal urethral sphincter, external urethral sphincter, they all work together. So if one of the key players is defective, we cannot have normal voiding or normal nictitation. So if I have the detrusor muscle is contracting before it's, it should contract normally, what is going to happen? I'm going to void a lot. So I cannot hold my urine. I'm, I'm, I'm contracting my bladder all the time. So this is what uh, urge incontinence means. It means that they have an increased urge to go to the restroom. So uh, the, the bladder or the detrusor muscle is going to contract uh, frequently and at random intervals. So patients are gonna present with nocturia, which is good to keep note of because they're not um, at a control of their detrusor muscle activity. Now, this is where I can sort of scratch your brain. From what I taught you, the pathway uh, of uh, from, from the receptors. So we have, I'll, I'll make it a little easier for you. So if I were to give you three receptors, alpha one, uh, beta 2 uh, or M3. If I were to give you all of the three receptors that I told you about, or parasympathetic, okay? Oh, para. If I were to give you all three, and I told you, if you were uh, asked to create a drug, okay, that, that, can, that, that can help with the symptoms of urgent incontinence, what pathway are you going to target? And better yet, let me link it to this picture if they are really trying to make your questions hard. So which, where can I, uh, which part of this can I um, sort of uh, act on? I'm going to try and, and see if anyone's answering in the chat. If not, I'll, I'll answer it, it's fine. Okay. Okay, I'll answer it. So um, if you have an overactive detrusor muscle, you want the detrusor muscle to, re to relax, what can you target? Let's look, we'll go step by step. Can we target this, the stretch receptors, the, the first part, the sensory part? No, it's, it's, it's gonna be useless. Should we target the synapsing portion? No, it's going to be useless. I'm not gonna know that my bladder is full. Why would I target that? Can I target area number three right here? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, I'll, I'll target this area. What else can I target? 
uh, area number four. Should I target area number four? Mm, sure, it, it works, it works, but not really. Should I target area number eight? Yes. So if I were to choose between area number three and area number four, I, uh, eight, I'd choose area number eight. Why? This is the M3 receptors. Because I want to act on the drug the, that, that is usually uh, given to treat uh, urge incontinence are anti-muscarinic receptors. These decrease the detrusor activity all overall. These decrease the detrusor muscle activity overall. This is where I was sort of at an awe because I personally would go for beta-2 here, beta-2 receptors. I would inhibit the beta-2 receptors and um, inhibit the overactive uh, detrusor muscle activity. However, the, the, the logical or the, the response that I got from researching, Sarahtan, I did not get a clear-cut answer. However, the, the answer that I got from researching is that we are trying to target the voiding portion of it so we are the problem isn't with the urge the problem is with the voiding we're trying to decrease the voiding load voiding load on the patient so that they can sleep have a better sleep at night so this is why m3 is the uh, treatment so anti uh muscarinic drugs to relieve the detrusor activity now for the second form of incontinence this is called stress incontinence and unfortunately i regret to inform you that ladies are uh, very prone to developing stress incontinence. Now, stress incontinence from its name, to, to, because once you put all the types of incontinences together, it can get a little confusing. So stress, always remember stress comes with uh, IBS, stress with IBS. Um, um, IBS is basically related to stomach pains and, and stuff like that. So increase in abdominal pressure. This is how I always like to remember it. So increase in abdominal <clears throat> pressure. So what increases abdominal pressure? Increase in abdominal pressure is caused by coughing. It's caused by uh, sneezing. It also is caused by pregnancy, which is the most important thing. So that scenario, the clinical scenario could be a pregnant female presents with increase in uh, urine leakage or uh, incontinence or any signs of incontinence. Uh, this is important to uh, take note of. The classical finding is that patients present with urinary leakage with increase in abdominal uh, pressure. So this is what happens. So it's just, there is a defective sphincter. So a sphincter is going to be defective. I increase the intra-abdominal pressure or I'm applying pressure, in this case, a baby. And this is going to make the sphincter, it's going to overwhelm the sphinct sphincters and overwhelm the action of the sphincter. The third uh, type of incontinence is the overflow incontinence. The overflow incontinence is not a problem with the sphincter. It's not a problem with the detrusor muscle. It's a problem with emptying the bladder. So it could be either due to a sphincter problem in the external uterus sphincter, or it could be due to a blockage. So something blocking this pathway. I cannot empty the bladder because I'm blocking something. Uh, like what? Like a hypertrophic prostate, for example. Or the detrusor muscle cannot be, uh, can, cannot be active. What does that mean? So this is not a problem with the stretching. It's not a problem with, an with a hyperactive detrusor muscle. In fact, it's a problem with an, with an underactive detrusor muscle. The detrusor muscle, sort of like a... Like a um if, if you have like um i'm trying to explain it if you if you have a piping bag the piping bag that you use to pipe on uh, uh whipping cream or uh frosting on a cupcake this is a think of this as your detrusor muscle so you apply pressure on the piping bag to pipe on the the the, the whipping cream on the cupcake but you are, you're applying pressure. So this is the detrusor muscle contraction. If you are not applying pressure, the piping bag isn't gonna work itself. It's not gonna release the, the, the frosting or the whipping cream out of it, unless you apply this kind of pressure. So for urine to be emptied completely, you have to do this last squeezing effect to from the detrusor muscle itself to make sure that all the bladder is voided. So with overflow incontinence, patients are not voiding completely they have a problem with emptying their bladder. So they can go to the bathroom. It's just their problem is not is with emptying the bladder completely. So they go to the bathroom a lot. They feel like they have urgency. Um, uh, they feel uh, about the fullness in their bladder. So this is important to, to take note of. So we have three types of incontinences that I mentioned. We have urge, we have stress, and the last one is overflow incontinence. I've sort of put an image right here just to explain the different types of uh, 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 
three types of incontinences or the two types, the important ones. So we have urgency and we have stress. Stress, you can see here that there's a problem. There's a, a, a pressing force on the bladder itself. And for urgency incontinence, if we can go and just sort of correlate, we said that the problem is going to be uh, absence of any of the above, but the problem is going to be an overactive detrusor muscle. Look at the detrusor muscle. This is the normal position of the detrusor muscle and it is uh, contracting right here. Lastly, we have a problem, the third big topic. So we mentioned two, two three big topics, uh, uh, autonomic uh, bladder. The second one is uh, the incontinences. And our third important big uh, sort of umbrella term is going to be problems that are associated with urinary tension. Urinary tension could be acute or it could be chronic. So when it's in the acute version, usually both of them occur in elderly men. This could be due to prosthetic enlargement. Um, so we have the increased resistance to the flow uh, and the urine stream is poor. How will the patient present if it's uh, if we have acute urinary retention? They will present with a dribbling of the urine. So the urine is not an, an interrupted midstream of the urine. So halfway through, through their urination, they'd complain that they stop. So this could be from an acute problem in urinary retention. Um, and in the chronic portion, this is essentially the same thing. It's just, it's a, uh, uh, they could have the same etiology. It's just, this is a long-term effect. The long-term effect is here, keyword, hypertrophic bladder. So how can I check the hypertrophic bladder wall? I check the pressure of it and the pressure is going to be increased during a micturing uh, system uh, metrogram. Remember when I told you that the system metrogram is basically, I'm just checking the bladder pressure and I'm plotting it on an X and Y axis. And I told you that at some point we're going to have a normal increase and then after that we're going to have a spike. Yeah, well, these patients are not going to have the steady increase. These patients are going to have a spike right away. Why? Because I've lost my bladder tone. I've lost the Laplace law. I've lost my ability to uh, um, sort of uh, allow the stretch and recoil of the bladder. So this uh, is the last portion of the abnormalities in the bladder. And this is our fourth checkpoint. Uh, I hope everyone is currently and still listening and I hope you guys are, are not too overwhelmed. Uh, I just wanted to uh, end this um, session with a couple of important questions. So this is my summary slide. I really don't like uh, putting bullet points at the end of the summary slide because I think it's very important to just sort of wrap thing, uh, things together with the students. So personally, I did never attended uh, as, or not never, I, I rarely attended sessions that are aid sessions or external resource sessions one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I usually like them, um, but with the speed increased. So I'm, I'm assuming you guys are listening to me in times two speed right now. So for the summary slide, if you're listening to me, I really want you to sort of go step by step in everything that we went through. So we went through the important point, which is the physiology portion of this. And I'm just going to go over it one last time. We mentioned key important points. Where are the questions going to come? Questions are going to come when the bladder is empty and when the bladder is full. When the bladder is empty, we have important players. What are our important players? The detrusor, internal urethra sphincter, external urethra sphincter. We have the pathway coming directly or coordinating between the cerebral cortex, uh, the thoracolumbar vertebrae, and the sacral part, and then the pons. The pons is an important switch, the switcher, the box, the diffuser box, Hagena, which is switch on and switch off. <clears throat> so depending on what I need from my bladder, I switch on and off. But the, what are the buttons that we are working with? With the pontine storage center and the pontine micturition center. So when I want to empty the bladder, I store. Uh, when, when I have an empty bladder, I store. When I want to, uh, when I have a full bladder, I empty. I hope that makes sense. I also left something that I did not read, but it was important here. Remember, this is, this is it. This is the take home message. Remember, when... We want the sphincters to relax. The muscles contract. The muscles have to contract. They work in opposite coordination. When the sphincters relax, the muscles have to contract. Same concept as the piping bag, the, the piping bag that I explained to you, the detrusor muscle. So what are the important uh, uh, things to remember here? Beta 3, alpha 1, M3. Beta 3, what is it going to do? Going to cause the detrusor muscle to relax, done. Alpha 1, what is it going to do? Act with norepinephrine. Beta 3 and uh, alpha 1, act with norepinephrine. I've noticed that I said beta 2 before. I apologize, it's beta 3. At some point in this lecture, I said beta 3, beta 2 by accident, it's beta 3. I think, I think you guys caught on. I hope you caught on. That means you're listening. So... Um, so uh, I mentioned beta-3 receptors. Beta-3 receptors we're working with. What 
norepinephrine. <clears throat> With the function of norepinephrine, what happens? So in the case of beta-3, we're relaxing the detrusor muscle. In the function of alpha-1, we want the uh, internal urethral sphincter to contract. Done. We have the pontine nucleus. We mentioned it. We, we have the parasympathetic pathway. Pudendal nerve. Pudendal nerve activates what? The external uterus sphincter. Through what? Acetylcholine. And which receptor? M3 receptor. Done. Moving forward, when the bladder is full. When the bladder is full, what are we working with? We're working with the same receptors. It's important to know just the physiology part. So beta 2 receptors or beta 2 receptors. Ah, see, I caught on the mistake. Beta 2 receptors. Let me just double check really quickly. Because these, these things tend to get confusing and I do not want you to leave with a confused mind. I want you to stay focused with me. So um, is it beta three or beta two? It's beta three, beta three. We're triple checking. Because I hate when this happens. I hate when 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 I, I let an information stick to my head or a piece of info stick to my head and then it's wrong. It's beta three. Beta three, M three, beta three. Now you can't forget it. So M three, both of them are the same number. So three, the rule of three, one, three. Okay, so three, one alpha and M three here. Here's a mnemonic for you, babe. So beta three decrease el, 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 uh, the function. When we decrease it or it inhibit its function, we are going to increase contraction. Alpha one, when we are inhibiting its function, we are increasing relaxation of the sphincter. Remember, muscle exit sphincter. M3, same concept. We are trying to relax the sphincter. We are going to relax and cause voiding in this process. I mentioned this diagram and I told you guys to go over it once, twice, and three times. This is if, if you were going to do something in the lecture, do this part. This is important. Uh, systometrogram, important question. I told you the most important thing to remember are these two diagrams that usually show up on exams. It's just to understand that this is called the micturition waves. What is the basal area? And I told you, what is the point in which po after it, the, the, the tone is going to increase. The point is 400 usually. That's the cutoff point. What explains this is the Laplace law. And uh, when can we use this tone? When we have a hypertrophic bladder because the bladder tone is lost. Uh, we mentioned uh, the, the abnormalities that can arise. We mentioned the atonic bladder. We said that this is a problem with the, not a problem with the voluntary control, but a problem with the stretch re reflexes or the sensory uh, receptors that are present. So sensory. And then we mentioned the three types of incontinences that it's important to know about. The urge, the stress, and the overflow incontinence. We said urge is related to detrusor. So detrusor muscle. So remember, urge, you have the urge to hit someone, you hit someone with all your force. And what do you use in your force? You use a muscle. So this is how you won't forget it. You use a muscle to hit someone. And then we have abnormal uh, stress incontinence. And I put a picture of a baby so that you remember. Um, I also put the when, uh, when you have stress, you have IBS. So when you have stress, you have IBS, which is related to uh, abdomen. So this is increase in abdominal pressure. And lastly, we have overflow incontinence. Overflow incontinence, I told you, could be due to a blockage. And I've uh, attached this diagram. Lastly, I ended the lecture with um, types of urinary retention. And I said that types of urinary retention could be acute or chronic. And I mentioned that this is due to either a blockage, an enlarged prostate, whatever that disrupts the urine flow. And I said that these could have the same etiologies. However, if the acute becomes chronic, then we are going to see bladder changes. And this is, can be measured on the uh, systometrogram because I'm losing the bladder tone. This is our last and final checkpoint. And we have summarized. Now, this is the portion of the that matters. This is how you solve the questions and how you... Um, uh, to uh, sort of tackle them head on. So they're asking you the, see, I told you this is an important exam question. The flat segment of the systometrogram manifests in which of the following? So I told you the thing that allows stretch, the balloon example is Laplace law. So it's A. Okay. Let's see here. A systometrogram reports a volume of 150 ml. At this volume, which of the following physiological changes take place? So Let's let's sort of cut an image of a systometrogram and bring it down so that we can um, work on it. Okay. I choose this one. Okay. Let's go down. Oops. 
well, that was ineffective. <laughs> okay. All right, here's a systematogram type. Um, they're telling you we're at a volume of 150 ml. We're not, we're not increasing. We're not increasing anything yet. I told you the cutoff point is usually 400. So the bladder is sending the first signal to, for urination at 150. Are we full yet? No. When did I tell you we start firing signals when in the, in the bladder full diagram at 200 mLs? So at 200 mLs, no signal for urination is sent. No, we are sort of firing signals. Whenever I have something, uh, whenever I start urinating or the bladder becomes full, I start firing signals. The external uterus sphincter is open. No, the sphincters are always closed. Is the internal sphincter open? No, it's closed. The pontian micturition center will inhibit somatic vo voluntary innervation. Um, this means inhibiting somatic voluntary innervation. Remember, this is related to the uh, part about the pudendal nerve. So um, am I inhibiting the pudendal nerve? Of course not. I want my external urethral sphincter to remain closed. So this C and D, I think, are the same thing, so no. And then lastly, we have the uh, no signal for urination is wrong, so the answer is A. Moving forward, we have a 25-year-old male, delayed urination while traveling. Delayed urination, he can control it. So which part of this? This is the part that is related to the voluntary control. I think there are... Okay. Okay. I was just checking their chats. Okay, so this is the portion that's related to voluntary control. Which of the following wing muscles allow him to have voluntary control? Remember the diagram I told you, most of the exam questions are gonna come from this diagram. So where is the area of voluntary control? Number eight, because it cannot be number four. Number four, we have two sphincters. Number four is involuntary. And number eight is voluntary. So eight is voluntary control. So the answer here is D, so external urethral sphincter. Which of the following A or B shows internal urethral sphincter? It's definitely A. And what, what is the nerve supply of uh, the internal urethral sphincter? Um, I sort of wanted uh, it to be a little more interactive, but it's okay. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood the nerve supply. The, the, the micturition portion, the, the, um, the internal urethral sphincter is, I told you, if you guys remember, it's basically the portion of the autonomic nervous system. <clears throat> uh, and I really want to correlate it to the diagram that I drew above. So this is the internal urethral sphincter. I told you hypogastric gives off a branch to the detrusor muscle. This is all part of the parasympathetic ganglion. So, uh, so autonomic nervous system is the answer. Autonomic nervous system is the su supply because it's all part of the autonomic nervous system. Uh, and you guys, I'm sure, can trace back the supply process from everything that I drew and the two, uh, two chains that it gives, the hypogastric, and then the area that is related to the internal sphincter. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. If you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Or uh, if I have, if, if, if there's anything that you'd like me to correct, please do let me know. And I wish you all the best. You guys are the futures of medicine, inshallah. Like to bring all the best and the success and give them all the best, Ya Rabb. I wish you all the best. And see you when you are seniors, inshallah, colleagues in the hospital. Best of luck, everyone. <laughs>